Thank you. Uh, welcome back, everybody. I hope everybody had a good break. Greetings from North America, from Toronto, Canada. My name is Stephen Peck. I'm the founder and president of Green Roofs for Healthy Cities. We're the North American Green Roof Association. Been working on the green roof market now for 21 years. It's where I got some of these gray hairs uh, along the way. Um, I want to uh, thank all of my European colleagues for their presentations in the last session. I think they did a great job of um, demonstrating some fantastic projects and some work to develop policy in their countries. And they're all driven by passion and uh, some excellent work uh, taking place in, uh, among all those countries. So thank you for that. Um, I'd like to thank also the staff of the European chapter of the World Green Infrastructure a network. I'm the treasurer of the World Green Infrastructure Network and one of the co-founders. And I would like to thank uh, Matteo and um, uh, um, um, Milena and uh, our other uh, other members for helping us out to uh, put this wonderful event together today. Um, I'd like to start by um, introducing quickly the panelists. We've got Veronica Manfredi, who's a director of the Quality of Life uh, uh, Director General Environment of the European Commission. Uh, Serpa Pitikinen, uh, who's a member of the European Parliament. Did I get that right, Serpa? Serpa, thank you. Uh, Willem uh, Jan Gossen, Policy Officer, GG Klima Adaptation Unit, European Commission. And uh, Uwe Harsman, who's the Managing Director of Optigrün. <clears throat> thank you for joining us today. Um, before we get started, I thought uh, it might be helpful to just provide a little bit of background, a little snapshot of what we've been doing in North America, following on the leadership that we've seen for many years uh, in Europe. Um, back in 2015, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency opened up the Clean Water State Revolving Fund program to allow uh, projects involving green infrastructure. Now that's a multi-billion dollar program that funds wastewater treatment plants, uh, stormwater management, uh, as well as drinking water facilities. Uh, last year, the, the fund uh, was about 145 billion US dollars. It's a cost shared fund between the federal government and state level governments. But the big news was in 2015, they said green infrastructure projects will be um, eligible for that type of funding uh, for the first time. Um, so that was a big policy uh, win and a recognition of the importance of green infrastructure as one of the tools in the toolbox to, uh, to manage uh, water uh, in our cities. Um, in, uh, in Canada, uh, in April, the budget that just came down in April uh, this year the federal government of Canada recognized for the first time um, green infrastructure. They set up a natural infrastructure fund, which will provide, provide hundreds of millions of dollars for municipal natural infrastructure projects. By natural infrastructure, we mean also green infrastructure. That's the term that they use. Um, and that, that's a first uh, ever to have a dedicated fund uh, from the federal government. Um, they also changed the policy programming uh, for something called the Disaster Mitigation and Adaptation Fund, which is a, uh, a fund that's working to prepare um, governments, local governments for the impacts of climate change. Um, and they, they changed it because previously you had to be, the, the smallest project had to be 20 million Canadian dollars. And the reality of green infrastructure is a lot of green infrastructure projects are smaller than $20 million. They're not huge concrete, you know, cisterns and so forth. So they amended that program. They took a third of the funding, about $700 million, which they are now making available to green infrastructure funding in Canada. So that's another uh, indication, a trend to win in terms of green infrastructure. Uh, green Roofs for Healthy Cities at the local government level, where we've spent most of our time and effort, just like many of our counterparts in Europe, um, we've seen uh, mandatory requirements, i.e. you must put a green roof on a new building implemented recently in cities such as New York, San Francisco, Montreal, Toronto, Portland, Cambridge, and so on. And that's because there's a growing recognition at the local government level that the roof spaces can do so much more for our quality of life. And so they're requiring new build, uh, developers of new buildings to put green roofs and or solar panels or a combination thereof. Um, all together. Um, and we have many more cities that have policies and regulations that support green, green roofing. 
Um, right now, uh, as we speak, we are advocating for the passage of a bill. It's called HR 1863. It's a half, it's a $500 million uh, dedicated fund that would fund uh, green roof installations on schools for children uh, in poor neighborhoods throughout America. Uh, and it's called uh, HR 1863. And we're advocating to our congressional representatives right now to see that bill integrated into the American Jobs Plan, which is Joe Biden's multi-trillion dollar infrastructure program that they're going to try to push through Congress in the fall. Um, what's really cool about this um, $500 million pr uh, project uh, program is that it not only do we get the benefits of, you know, air quality and green and um, uh, stormwater management and um, reducing the urban heat island, we also provide space for children that often don't have access to any green space in poor neighborhoods throughout the United States. Um, that there'll be a job component, a local job component that will be built into the program as well. So not only does it do some of the hard infrastructure aspects that we know well, it also goes into the social and um, environmental and human well-being right, and equity, social equity aspects that we need to address in many places uh, throughout the world. So we're very excited about that. So thanks, I just wanted to take a minute to sort of create a broader uh, policy context uh, for our discussion today, which is gonna be how green infrastructure can help with climate adaptation, particularly looking at water. I uh, did a little digging and found that from 1980 to 2019, 81% uh, of all the economic losses in Europe which totaled $446 billion uh, were climate change related. And much of that had to do with flooding. Now that's according to the European uh, Environment Agency. And one of the things that amazes me about people that are, um, try, wanna block or um, uh, somehow stop climate change action because it's too expensive is they fail to realize that not addressing climate change comes with a huge multi-trillion Euro expenditure price tag. You know, the longer we wait, the more expensive it gets. So we know that climate change is going to cost us a lot of money if we don't move to address it rapidly. And we need to continue to communicate that. Climate change is already impacting our daily lives, uh, despite the COVID hair and tummy. And we also have problems in terms of more frequent intense rainfall. We've got more overflows, particularly uh, rivers is a big issue in Europe. And so that's putting a lot of pressure on people um, in terms of their environmental, economic and infrastructural well-being. And not to mention our wastewater treatment systems that get flooded and damaged and so forth. So from your different perspectives, what do you think the best solutions are? And I think it is solutions. It's not one solution. It's not just gonna be green roofs. It's gonna be a mul multiple solutions. How do we adapt to the changing um, you know, climate that uh, we're all gonna be facing in the near future? I'm wondering if Manfredi, you might uh, lead us off. Veronica, would you mind? How do we adapt to this? First of all, many thanks for inviting me. I'm really honored. Uh, as you imagine, that this uh, webinar comes at a particularly topical point in time because the European Union has adopted recently, it was in February this year, the Climate Adaptation Strategy, has adopted uh, just a few days ago uh, its um, Zero Pollution Action Plan. Uh, it has been adapting a Sustainable Blue Economy Strategy. I would also dare say that also calls for, you know, revamping the power of also of what happens at, at sea along our coastal areas, rural areas in a manner that we also serve the climate mitigation and climate adaptation goals. But what I like very much, Mr. Peck, out of your introductory remarks from the other side of the Atlantic, is that to me, there is a clear convergence of mindset towards building an agenda of co-benefits. And this is, in my view, at the core of what we are trying to do with European Green Deal. What is beautiful, and I would say even exciting, uh, I've uh, over 20 years, I'm afraid already by now, of experience as an EU official in this period of time, is that you see that really the uh, Green Deal is an agenda that is connecting all the dots to face what I call the four ecological crisis that the planet is facing and that has in the COVID-19, uh, um, I would say the symptom, you know, the tip of the iceberg and certainly not the cause. And we're talking about these interlinkages between climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution and unsustainable use of resources. And already from what you said, Mr. Peck, it's clear that essentially what are we looking at in terms of practical solutions for our cities? Well, 
I would dare already throwing in the in the arena the, the, the magic word, we need sponge cities. And you know what I like about this concept of a sponge city is that it is at the same time something that absorbs, is flexible in absorbing, re rejects back what is needed, and somehow brings back, and this is very dear to our heart, as you can imagine in the environment we make of this, the motto of our policy making, bringing nature back in our cities. Bringing nature back because by definition, this serves a lot of purposes, including the social one that you were stressing so correctly, and that you will find reproduced in all our policy papers. You know, we always say this agenda of ecological transition is very much an agenda for social inclusion, fairness, new types of jobs. Uh, we, we, we do believe in that, and I'm happy to find the new someone who has been struggling to get proper green roofs since over 20 years. We believe in that as well as one of the uh, solutions that, that need to be looked at. But I would say in general, we believe in a more intelligent urban water management. There, I think we have to reciprocally learn from each other. I know that San Francisco, for example, if my information are correct, is one of the leading uh, city in the US that has been launching this concept of circular management inside buildings. Uh, wonderful, uh, we are looking into that. At the same time, we have also some very interesting experiences already happening in Europe, uh, in particular, not surprisingly, in the parts of Europe which have been facing the highest amount of water droughts traditionally. So typically you have to look south in Europe, but what we see, and I'm sure that the uh, honorable member of the parliament who is with us today will testify to that. What we see now is that also in Northern Europe, episodes of even water scarcity are increasing. And in general, what we see is that climate change is meaning a disruption in the water cycle. I mean, <laughs> I'm speaking to you from a very gray Brussels those days, we are living in month of May. That resembles more like, you know, the, the, the Arctic spring than the normal spring we used to have in, in Brussels this period. Many more rainfall events, uh, much more intense, uh, a completely change disrupted uh, intensity of, 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 um, of this type of events. So what can we do? Well, I will have the pleasure to dive deeper into that in a moment. But first of all, I think in Europe, we are pretty lucky to have a very robust regulatory framework, which is already in place. And I would mention, first of all, both the Water Framework Directive and the Floods Directive that really are encompassing instruments that give the possibility to our member states to become much better in connecting the dots between the climate change science, what we know and what we can forecast uh, and you know, devising measures that you know, help us in getting there where we need to be. Uh, we have the ongoing review of the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive, but if you allow me, I would like to dive deeper into that maybe in, in a second round, not to go into too many details right now, but I can give you the assurances from now that we are looking very granularly into how possibly set also some regulatory requirements that the fact that will make it compulsory for our cities to better cope with storm overflows, urban runoffs and similar, and also recuperate uh, rainwater uh, and excess water in general. And of course, uh, we have our um, zero pollution perspective, which calls for all the time looking at how we can conceive our urban mobility, our heating system, our consumer choices in a manner that we do not pollute further our water and the air, of course, that we breathe. Thank you so much. Great. Wow. That was uh, quite a lot of uh, information there. That was really, that was great. Um, anybody else would like to speak to the, uh, the question of solutions to the challenges that we face in terms of our urban water systems? Serpa? Yes, I'm trying to find my, raise my hand. Uh, uh, actually, now I did it. Yes, indeed. I think that we would need to take a holistic perspective and system thinking to say it in everyday words, it is a fish principle, because if you try to uh, uh, look and cook the fishes on the table separately and then the potatoes separately and then the onions and whatever, you wonder why don't I ever get the fish soup. But then again, if you have the whole picture and you have the recipe, you understand that when you put the parts together and boil them, the end results is more and different than the ingredients separately on the table. So basically it isn't that more difficult in politics 
even though it is because we are very much in silos in water retention, in wastewater treatment, in uh, in, in uh, landscaping, in uh, building, in emission prevention, and you know economics and transportation, and uh, I could all, could go on for uh, two hours. But then, if you look at it from the perspective of a city as as a uh, system, and if you add greenery, wise biodiversity, friendly greenery in roofs, walls sideways, uh, streets, bus stops. And we have a wonderful example in both sides of the pond, what you can do uh, and how you can sort of re-green the existing cities. You actually have six multiple benefits. More places for biodiversity. Mm -hmm. It actually cleans the air. Uh, from the uh, noxies and small particles. It actually <clears throat> uh, uh, acts like insulation for the heat wave and for the cold. It prevents excessive winds in the cities. You know, the tunnels, if you badly plan how the city can be really sort of a, a wind tunnel where you could test the cars actually. And then, <clears throat> If you look at uh, the climate, all that would function for the climate. Uh, it, find, it acts as a sink, it is the insulator, it provides uh, oxygen and the water retention. And then if you plan the whole system uh, so that you have a natural capacity to uh, the hold the waters, you create wonderful, nice small parks and ponds and whatever instead of a shoe, it's uh, lines that are flooding on the streets. So you add uh, uh, again to the biodiversity for the aesthetics, for, uh, for functionality, for places to people to walk and rest and exercise. Plus then we see that our cities are aging. And that means we need to have not only, you know, the vast central park somewhere, like, you know, one hour away, but the pocket parts, parks, uh, and in, in some cases, it could be the green roof. What is the furthest that you can get outside with your roll later, well, with your very limited uh, condition. So it's, it's good for people and to get them uh, better health. And we know that the green actually works uh, for your immunity, uh, positively on immunity resistance and mental health. We all are more relaxed and joyful when we see beautiful greeneries instead of a gray walls. That's not a surprise. Mm -hmm. And so now we actually know this sort of a multiple beneficiary, but you need to take that first in hand. And when you start planning the renovation, the deep renovation, the uh, uh, upscaling of the city uh, or whatever, or then not to talk about building a new one, you have to, sort of a start with the greenery, what you say, what you add, where and how, and this is German regulation. You need to compensate all the green, what you take up for the building in greenery, in green infrastructure. So uh, uh, with easy, easy access, you can balance that. And by that way, you, you get really a, a fish, fish soup, multiple benefits everybody loves and likes and uh, that serves ecosystem uh, 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 services, plus people pay more for those uh, housings uh, mm -hmm. that have a nice green uh, environments instead of uh, the, the flooding and the heat and the windy and the bad ones. So it is now to get it in the brains of all architects, they are already pretty much on there, but then the constructors, the, uh, the, the builders, the, uh, the, the physical, I love urban planning and physical planning because that is where you start on the scratch. And then on, on of course, policy decision making it in municipal, uh, national, and in our case, uh, European level. How does the European Union with all these siloed policies, like that, that, that as you're saying, Veronica, that kind of point in the same, are pointing in the same direction, 
How does the European effect change at the local planning and policy level in all those cities throughout Europe? Like what, 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 what kind of tools can you do to actually have any impact at that level? Shall I reply? I don't know whether my colleague also from DG Clima wants to intervene. Shall I go first? Sorry? Go ahead. <laughs> I, I think that what is um, beautiful, although also difficult, I mean, let's, let's recognize this from the outset. Huh? This is such a transformational agenda that it comes with, you know, a, a certain level of, uh, yeah. Uh, investment of from all sides but what is beautiful is indeed that the direction is very very clear and we have put in place also at european level a number of instruments that facilitate cooperation at urban level not only we are i would say building upon and revamping the already successful experience of the covenant of mayor that i, I trust that my colleague from dg Lima can expand a little bit more but also i don't know whether you're aware but when it comes to accompany more specifically the environmental policy so exactly what the honorable member was referring to greening means biodiversity, clean air, better water management, etc. We have set up in October last year an ad hoc green city accord agenda that really has the ambition to bring together those people in the cities that are in charge, you know, in the various municipal offices where with indeed clean air, waste management, greening, urban planning. Not to mention, uh, you may be familiar with that, with the fact that our president has launched already one year ago, a very ambitious initiative called the New European Bauhaus, through which she is creating a pool for collecting together, I would say best and most engaged minds among urban planners, architects, engineers, uh, constructors, to create what we call the beautiful sustainable style of the future, and these are company, this, this cradle of thinker, you know, the Bauhaus has a meaning, uh, you know, that we had the Bauhaus during a very well-defined period in, in, in European history. And why do we need it again? Because I think that the thinking behind is that after this horrible COVID-19 pandemic, we really hope to drive Europe towards a new renaissance somehow. And this is the kind of thing that we need. Well, this European Bauhaus will be working together um, with the colleagues in charge with carrying out the renovation wave initiative. This is also a very, I would say, innovative agenda that the European Commission is for the first time trying to steer, of course, in coordination with all the stakeholders, with the uh, urban actors, the mayors, the cities, etc. But it's really an agenda for renovating the built environment in the light of the fact that we see that they are also one of the most important remaining factors of greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution at the same time, huh? not to mention also problem linked to indoor air quality that I think have become more tangible for many citizens in these, uh, um, you know, uh, long uh, confinement periods in our houses or, or whatever, working spaces. So um, I, I think indeed that the dots are connected and there are a number of fora that are bringing all the actors together, including mayors, Going back a moment to the zero pollution action, um, uh, action plan, I can tell you, I can give you the scoop that we will launch on the 4th of June and adopt the Golder Forum in cooperation with the Committee of the Regions, which is our institution really working with the regional urban level. So as you see, we are really working hand in hand with the people that are changing things on the ground. Excellent, wow. Um, some additional interesting uh, initiatives there that uh, sound very promising. Uh, Wilhelm, do you have? Uh, would you like to join us on the policy discussion? Here? Yes, and thank you, and thank you for, uh, for having me here. Um, it is indeed uh, there is a lot going on in Europe at this moment, and and we have already uh, established all these relations with 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 the member states, with the regions, and with the local authorities. And and I think indeed uh, the. Um, uh, the the integrate, integrated approach with all the policies uh, connected. I think that is really what is what is very um, very important at this stage. And uh, like said, we uh, one of the um, initiatives is the Convenant of Mayors, where we both address climate mitigation and climate adaptation. Uh, as you know, uh, of course, mitigation uh, will continue to be on the top of of the list, but. Uh, 
uh, yeah, we are at, at this moment, we're all experiencing that the climate is changing and we need adaptation as well. So they are, they are both in balance now, nowadays. And uh, in the, like Veronica just said, we had uh, since uh, February, a new uh, adaptation strategy. Um, it is um, very enthusiastically welcomed um, until now, and, and <coughs> the member states will will uh, will uh, next month agree on uh, conclusions on that. But it looks very promising, and we need all to cooperate. I think that is very clear. Uh, in the end, it's the local at local level where the, the the measures has to be taken. So it's all about how can we support. Uh, local community authorities, um, um, com um, businesses, citizens with their actions, and we need to consider at which level we can support with that. And we need all all levels, including uh, the European and even the global levels, in working together. That's great. Yeah. Th so I mean, one of the things that's so uh, uh, unique. Um, about green roofs in particular as a form of green infrastructure that's been part of my passion for many years is that it has it's it's an elegant solution because it does all these different things right it's not just a single problem single you know solution it, it, it has a multiplicity of benefits um the general services administration which is the largest landowner in the united states it manages thousands of buildings has been building green roofs for 15 years. They did a study for Congress uh, back in about uh, 2010, and they looked at the cost benefit of green roofs. And in that study, they analyzed an extensive green roof, lightweight green roof with primarily sedums. And they found that for every dollar of public money spent per square foot, it would generate $30 of public benefit. $1, $30. Now you show me a, a form of infrastructure that we can invest in publicly as citizens with our tax dollars that can give that kind of return on investment. And it's because of all these different solutions, like you're saying, Serpa, you know, it's all the ingredients in the soup together. It's a very powerful way to spend, uh, invest public money and, and program support. Um, and that's what we're, we're finding uh, here in, in North America. <clears throat> um, what um, I'm wondering if you have um, any sense of what needs to be done to move the urban greening agenda forward that's not already being done? Um, is it, uh, is it, what are the things that need to happen? Do we, uh, do we need to set some standards for green space for cities in Europe that have to be adhered to? Is it that kind of thing? Is it, is it educational? Is it, uh, financial support because of the upfront cost to do greening and the maintenance cost? Like what, what, what do you think in a perfect world, you know, what do you think needs to happen? Um, this is sort of our ideas corner, you know, maybe uh, Uwe, we can, you haven't heard from you yet. Maybe you could uh, blue sky for us and tell us what you think sort of needs to happen. You're in the trenches, you're building these systems on a regular basis. You employ people all over Europe. What, what do you think? Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's 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 uh, it's really great. Uh, let's say to give a statement from the industry. Just one one word uh, uh, about OptiGreen. We are in the market since 49 years now. So we started back in 1972. Last year we did about four million uh, of square meters of green roof, 6,000 projects all over Europe. So we practically. Uh, know what we are doing, and we are really happy to to hear what what's going on on the policy policy level. The sad thing about it is that back in the year 1977, we published a brochure. The title was Green Roofs, Luxury or Necessity. And all those benefits we are discussing today were already in there. And this brochure was published by, by ourselves and by two of our competitors who are still in the market. And so now we, are, we were talking for 45 years about those issues, which we are talking again today but the good thing is apparently everybody now wants to make it happen and this makes us, us very proud and and we are really happy and 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 uh, willing to to give our technical uh, knowledge to that um, what we can say is that all those those discussions we are having and all those possible solutions we are discussing they, they are easily to establish in, in practice. So this is this is common knowledge in the building industry, at least in, in the, the countries which are a little more advanced, which we had in the last panel. There's a slight difference, but 
the technique in doing it is there. It's just a combination and it's the willingness of all the people involved doing it. And, and I, I just want to, to present one example, which is which is a building plot in, in Offenbach, uh, which is close to Frankfurt. And this is a 1.8 hectare uh, building, which has, uh, or building property, which has about 350 apartments, uh, office space and, and uh, shopping spaces. And the idea or that the city said, yeah, you can build, but there's, you are not allowed to put any rainwater into the sewer system. So all the, the participation which falls on the building, on the property has to stay there. And we were able to do it by a combination of green roofs, of retention roofs, of cisterns, of infiltration units, and so on. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, what, what we did, we did a calculation so that the, the, the extra cost for doing that per apartment was less than 2,000 euros per apartment. So, and this in, a, in an area where you, where you pay something like six to 7,000 euros per square meter. So I think 2,000 extra euros per apartment is not extra money which, which, which will hinder you to, to implement such innovative solutions. So that's that's basically the, the the idea, and that's something I I, I want to to pass to the politics that we are really able from the practical side from implementing it. Uh, there are technical solutions, and um, in in order to support the, this, I think the best way to do it is to set clear standards. For example, like setting up a standard that you are not allowed to put any rainwater into the sewer system, or you you set a, a level that that you are allowed to just infiltrate or give three liters per second and hectare uh, into the sewer system, then that's something that the building owner, the planner, and, and of course the, the installation company, they have to find a solution to. And which is really important for that is, is it has to be controlled, of course, by, by the public municipalities or the, the people who are uh, giving permission to, to that. So I think that's 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 basically our idea. I'm I'm not so much a, a big fan of, of financial uh, subsidies because we are spending tax money on, on that, and and sometimes uh, the the money goes a little wrong. So I think it we should use this money much better for for. Um, telling the people what is possible to do training courses to 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 spread the information instead of giving uh, direct subsidies for somebody who at the end of the day doesn't need it uh, i i i would for the, in this example in, in offenbach um, i'm i'm pretty sure that if there would be, have been subsidies the cost per apartment wouldn't go down at the end of the day so, but that that's maybe my, my personal uh, idea on, on, on subsidies, but there are a lot of things which, which, which can be done. Uh, that's just a very new example from the city of Berlin from 21st of May and the city of Berlin, they, they just said, you are not anymore allowed to put in any rainwater into the public sewer system within the city of Berlin. And in order to support that, the city has founded a so-called rainwater agency and this agency will help the, the building owner or the, 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 the property owner to find a solution, what, what is possible, how it could be done. And, and the, I think that's, that's the right way also how, how politics can, can support. So give the information, talk, talk to the, the, the property owners right away, right from the beginning. And then at the end, there will be a technical solution and the industry will supply solutions for this problem. But the, the, the clearer we define what is the problem or what is the solution that the, the, the public wants to get from the industry, the better we, we, get, we find a solution. Um, I'm wondering if that your examples, which are really interesting, um, also apply to retrofit situations. You know the idea about yeah, it's yeah, it's it, 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 very it, different from new development, right? Yeah, yeah, but it it all it depends on it, it really depends on on the building situation. I would I would I would say in half of the retrofit situations it's possible, and the other half it's not possible. Uh, if for example, if, if you have a, a, a balanced flat roof with, with gravel on it, it's always possible because you remove the gravel and put on a green roof. Uh, this is about the same way. That that's possible, but but it's it's definitely not possible in all in all buildings. But uh, talking about rainwater again, even even in in existing buildings, you can you can. Uh, Build in some infiltration units or infiltration systems, so at least you can store some of the storm water on on the premises on on the property, even though it's if if it's an old building that, mm -hmm. that's possible. You you do not need to touch the roof all, all the time, 
Yeah, you also can do it in, in underground level. Uh, and, and I think it's it's a combination. It's There's no one single solution. It's like Silpa said, it's like the soup. You need to have a lot of ingredients. And then at the end, you you, you get, get a good solution and a good good meal. But you have to make sure that you are making fish soup. You have to. Yeah, have okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, everybody needs to know. Okay, that's the aim. We want to have fish soup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Does anybody else would like to weigh in on uh, Uwe's comments? And Willem? Yeah, Will? thank you. Yeah, I, I think indeed with today, the, this topic uh, adaptation uh, to climate change, I, I think that is very central there is that we, we need this long-term uh, uh, view and, and analysis. Um, I mean, we, uh, we are involved and we, we know more or less what's coming to us, but I think we really need is good analysis what how the future uh, already in a couple of decennia will look like and and we have to start making those investments now because they are much more cost effective and i think that that's then you also have you touch upon the silos um if you all in every aspect you you try to find a solution you will have a suboptimal solution so we all know that if you if you break down the silos and you look for solutions which are the best these are the best which multiple benefits and and of course um, and then also finance comes in I mean uh, subsidies uh, I can understand uh, you have to be careful on the other hand um, the money can be quite steering uh, a great example for me always is in in the city of Basel where we have the highest green roof uh, percentages um, in Europe and it all has to do with the, the local taxes, which uh, which makes it very profitable to have green roofs. And and there are a lot more of those examples. So I think we really need to embrace those examples and try to translate it in very specific policy, um, which is often at a local level, but it can also be at European level. And we have to find the right balance there in, in, in being active and taking measures. Uh, if I just can add one one comment in about 50% of all German cities with more than 50,000 inhabitants, they do have subsidy programs in one kind or the other. So it's 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 common in, at least in Germany, in the Netherlands, it's very similar. So it's 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 good to to do it, but uh, you have to be really careful because it's it's tax money and you shouldn't just spend it on uh, without uh, without any direct benefits or with uh, any control what, what what's what's happening. Yeah, so it, 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 it's a that, common, that, it's, it's a common happening? thing. Is it free money in Germany, in German cities? Is that what you're saying, Uwe? Free money? Yeah, not, not, not really. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's it not, not really. But, but um, it, yeah, it's, 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 it's a, it's, it's a, uh, let's say we, we shouldn't touch this is, issue too much because it's, it's always, it always has to do on how much money is available and, and what is the best way to, to spend money. And, and I think it's, 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 um, the problem is that there are also a lot of social problems in in the countries and then if if the people think okay they are spending money now just on on uh, on green walls or green green roofs and so on instead of solving those apparently more important social problems then we have to be careful that the whole idea not gets spoiled by, by that that's the point i want i want to make on it I think we, in, in many cases, it's really good to, to have financial benefits just in order to, to get the thing started. But at the end of the day, I'm pretty sure if somebody uh, wants to build a green roof, uh, he, he, it doesn't change his, his uh, decision if he gets five euros of, of benefit or, or 10 euros or, or 15 euros. So I think we need to start at an earlier point in, in make, creating the vision that's, that everybody wants to have a green roof or a green facade or green infrastructure. And, and I think that's, that's better than instead of, of giving away money. Mm -hmm. We found from our research that um, um, large, larger buildings like warehouses that have large roof spaces that are really uh, trying to create a building at the lowest possible cost per square meter, they have a more um, demand for <clears throat> subsidies than say a multi-unit um, apartment building like you were describing, uh, where there's an economic benefit that can be returned back to the developer from the amenity spaces that are created that adds to the value of the building. 
And so they're able to collect some of that, get some of that investment back, but it's not so much with a big warehouse, you know, that's, you know, um, storing goods and so forth. So the, the market is very uneven a little bit when it comes to green roofs and the need for uh, economic support, I think. Any thoughts or comments? Well, if I, if I may, um, yes, um, um, you need the supporting factor, but actually I would like to come back to the fish soup and about the, the, the ideas what we could do. And now I'm going to give a big thank you. Thank you for commission because you know, the European Parliament uh, suggested uh, to have a, a year of uh, urban green areas. And actually that was uh, accepted uh, with the new, newest uh, communication that came about the pollution free environment uh, from the commission. And so now we are ta uh, starting the preparations. And actually the inspiration comes from Finland. There we have had uh, over 20 years green years. That means that you can collect together all the uh, architects, city planners, politicians, local and regional level, uh, and uh, the uh, parliament level and government level decision makers, civil servants, NGOs from disabled to women, from children to sports and all in, in between. And you create concrete green infrastructures, you create seminars, you create events, you create that kind of a city-centered plan, uh, planning <clears throat> events where the citizens, let's say the disability, elderly, uh, uh, family, uh, children, families would say, this is what we would like to see in our cities and environmental organizations and so on. And <clears throat> it's uh, a wonderful tool the raise the awareness to create these concrete examples and put them all together so that we can share uh, and share the experience like now we are doing over the pond, what is happening in Canada and what is happening in, in, in Europe. And why do not to have a this kind of a green international green infrastructure year where we would really concentrate and uh, focus on on doing it together, collecting the best examples together, sharing the information, collecting the existing marvelous information together, because um, that does exist as we know, collecting the champions as we heard, who have been working 45 years already for this. And so who can tell how to do it and what to do and what is done. And then to, to create that kind of a resource uh, of ongoing research, examples, specialists, NGOs, and uh, uh, business uh, partners that are interested about that. Because we do have, and we need to have the regulatory tool, for example, for flooding or a biodiversity compensation, uh, land use compensation in cities. But uh, that can do as much as it can do. We need this activation and sort of the understanding, enlightenment, and the movement from bottom up. Yeah, I think because of COVID, Serpa, the, I think everybody's kind of really ready for something like that, you know, because of, imagine if you lived in a building during lockdown where you had a green roof you could go on top of and enjoy, compared to someone that had didn't have that, you know, it's quite a, uh, an advantage. So I think maybe now more than ever, people are, are ready for those types of initiatives. And I think that I stole the uh, word uh, 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 from the Veronica, so I, I didn't want to do it, sorry. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Pitekain. And actually, it's me having to apologize. I was stealing your word. Uh, no, it, it, just to say that, um, Indeed, uh, even when we have been conceiving uh, the, the, the climate adaptation strategy and all the other strategies, we always accentuate so much this local dimension and activation agenda. This is also why we have 
set up the climate pact, but also why, as I said, we are working in close cooperation with the Committee of the Regions, with the Covenant of Mayors, with the Green City Accord uh, actors, etc. But I very much sympathize with what you just said, Mrs. Pitikan. And so, you know, if one would ask me what has been the turning moment when all of a sudden you realize as a EU official, you really wanted to embrace the green agenda, I will tell you when I first watched the movie, The Man. I don't know whether you watched that wonderful French movie, uh, Tomorrow. Uh, it essentially, it's a collection of a number of cradle projects happening across the globe that show amongst others that urban greening is not only possible, but it's in really this agenda we win and so many other solutions in terms of mobility, transfer, happening everywhere, India, uh, Africa, etc. And it has been a driver for change. And I agree, we should at some stage, you know, really get there. I think we have created the conditions for getting there. Uh, the biodiversity strategy has a very precise urban greening agenda that we have to be implemented indeed within the Green City Accord. So, I mean, there are plenty of opportunities now to translate it, but I agree at some stage, what I would like to see is you know something in communication terms that comes out also from the European Commission, but I hope also very much from you know European Parliament all together, all the institutions showcasing this change that is possible, economically intelligent. Uh, we should never enough. Uh, we we never <laughs> stress this enough. I was pleased to hear what I heard about the one euro versus thirteen return. It's it's what we are saying all the time, and the only possible future in the light of the conditions in which we are. So yes, I, I, it's certainly one of the, my takeaway of the, today's uh, webinar. Wow, that's great. Um, so we'll be looking forward to uh, the, uh, the European uh, Green Infrastructure Celebration. Well, I'm not sure, I didn't quite hear what you, what you said, Serpa, they, they've approved a, a green urban year of green urban. What was the Yes, actual... uh, the, 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 uh, well, there has been a, a request by the European Parliament to which uh, the Honourable Member was referring, which has been now agreed by the European Commission. So 2022, well, we are preparing everything in order to try and make, make sure that this will be 2022. It depends a little bit on the co-legislative pro, um, process, but 2022 or late as I hope 2023 will be the European Year of Green Cities. And as you can imagine, in that context, uh, uh, the agenda for, indeed, what we are discussing today, urban greening and also, you know, uh, more resilient and more circular water management, preparation to climate adaptation solution, nature-based solutions as no regret options will be at the forefront. That sounds fantastic. Um, and the idea of a new, uh, an international green, urban green city celebration would be uh, would be a fantastic uh, thing for the World Green Infrastructure Network to take a look at. And we already have the Green Roof Day that's happening next week, but um, celebrating all of our successes is definitely a way to bring more people on board, have more public support, um, and you know work towards a, a better uh, uh, quality of life for everyone through investment and regulations. Are there any other regulatory? I mean, we've heard from Uwe, there's a regulatory, like no, no runoff, right? He said no runoff from the site. That forces the design team into making a bunch of decisions about the, the, the ingredients going into the fish soup, right? All these different ingredients holistically. Is that something that the European Union can support, that can, 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 it can get behind? Um, maybe with uh, technical support, maybe with financial support. How does that uh, work uh, within the context of the commission? Is that even achievable? I feel a little bit monopolizing the scene here, but I need to intervene because yes, I wanted to tell you that indeed we are currently revising this regulatory instrument that dates back 90s, the 90s. It's called the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive. By the way, to my knowledge as a, as a EU lawyer, I think it's, possibly the only legal instrument of the entire European acquis that has its first objective urban. So to tell you that already back in 1997, I believe or 94, when we adopted it, it was clear 
to the European co-legislator that this is really something that needs to be tackled at cities level. So this urban wastewater treatment directive has already proven over the last uh, over 20 years of application across the EU that it has provided an enormous amount of benefits. We used to have, and I think everyone in my age remembers quite a number of problems when it came to our coastal areas, much more intense phenomenon of eutrophication, et cetera. So the water purification skills have been dramatically improved across the EU thanks to this piece of law, and we have dramatically cut diseases, which existed when, more or less, I was born. Uh, Southern Italy, cholera, uh, it, was, it was an issue. Uh, now, these type of diseases are no longer uh, there. But what we have realized, of course, is that we need to step up the regulatory framework to the climate change challenges. So in that context, in the context of this revision that is ongoing, we are looking into ways to possibly set some regulatory standards, but I cannot be super precise because I mean, we're really carrying out now the impact assessment and everything. Regulatory standards indeed to prevent, mitigate the impacts of urban runoffs, storm overflows, um, basically boost also better management of rainfall, including you know more circular management of rainfall through buildings. And also let me tell you another in interesting regulatory strand, which is now open for consultation with stakeholders, huh? is the revision of the Industrial Emissions Directive. It's a piece of law that regulates our 52,000 largest industrial plants across the EU. So we are talking about really these, uh, you know, big industrial buildings with a view amongst others to improve their own water efficiency and climate resilience. So these two strands are going to cover, I would say, both the large industrial parks and cities across the EU potentially with you know, some regulatory requirements. But again, I, there are, uh, I, I cannot disclose everything, but I can just tell you, we're really very gradually looking into those and it's an open public consultation process, which is ongoing. So you have the power already established to reach down into local government activity and affect that kind of change. You have the regulatory authority to do that. Subject to the agreement of the co-legislators, European Parliament and Council, but the Commission proposes, and then we find an agreement with our co-legislators, and voila, depending on you know the gravity of the problem that, that is identified, it's EU-wide dimension, and I'm afraid to say that by now climate change, we start understanding that indeed impacts everywhere. Mm -hmm. if, we, if we come up with robust data, that's why I need a very robust impact assessment, uh, the Parliament and the Council may approve our proposals for solutions, or otherwise fine-tune it as they will deem it appropriate. But yes, we will come up with a proposal. Wow, that's uh, that's very exciting. That's very exciting. We've been very slow to regulate stormwater in North America. You know, we've dealt with the gray water and the wastewater. We've got the systems. We put the money in for the infrastructure, but the, the stormwater seems to be, often is very contaminated, as you know, very contaminated, uh, is flowing into our rivers and, and, and streams. Uh, all over in cities all over. Uh, so it's a really big problem here. So it'd be great to, if you can solve it and then share the answers with us, we would really appreciate that. Solve the problem SERPA and yes. then share the, share the answers with us. You know, we can look to, look what Europe's doing. We should be doing that. Uh, any other yeah, comments? Maybe. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, can, if I can, um... No, I think, um, yes, I, it's all about uh, taking measures at, at all levels and, and also uh, cooperation, which, which can be on, on a voluntary uh, level. For example, one of the examples I know is, is from the Netherlands and, and there the, the national, the regional and the local authorities all together, they, they agreed uh, two years ago on, on having a, a voluntary uh, stress test on, on climate. So for each city, there is going to be analysis of, of the future impacts of climate. And then um, as soon as, and this is, this is giving a, a really good insight of, of temperature on rainfall and droughts. And that is for, for local uh, administration, um, for mayors, really an eye opener often. And, and as a result, they, they are now all organizing uh, so-called climate dialogues. So with stakeholders, they're going to see, okay, if these are the impacts of the future, which, which measures are we going to take there? And I think this is also an example of, 
it's not always regulatory, but it's also this kind of processes which really helps to make uh, the good, to take the good measures. Because in the end, uh, there is also more support for compulsory uh, regulation if everybody is really convinced of, of that these measures like green roofs or more green parks or whatever uh, is really uh, beneficial. Mm -hmm. It's a good example as well. Yeah, and and when and when uh, we've seen that in North America, uh, New York has a very uh, the mayor's office of New York has a special body of scientists that conducts um, modeling research on the impacts of climate change in New York, and uh, especially things like the urban heat island mapping and um, and the and stormwater and um, there are social aspects as, as well. But when those things become public, those documents become public it does put pressure on uh, local decision makers and government to get going and start making that fish soup because, um, you know, who wants to have the worst urban heat island, right? Who, you know, nobody wants to be that city. It's terrible for tourism, investment. It's a very big blow if you have the worst air quality, you know, for example. So that type of stuff, Wilhelm, could be uh, very powerful, I think, those, uh, those analysis. What, what's the timeline on that program? How long before this gets done? Uh, uh, Veronica is probably telling the realities from the commission side and Willem also uh, from the climate politics and the, the uh, Fit for 55 pack. But if you ask politicians from the European Parliament, the timeline was yesterday. So that, mean, that means that it takes a lot of time, as we know, to build the rebuild and adjust the, our living environments and industries and everything. So we really would need to speed up our actions. And I hope that the commission could come up with the proposals as soon as possible. We hope that we could convene, convene a high ambition level in member states and I do hope that the parliament could be a good support and not even a support, but a ambition level raiser on, on this process to the commission's proposal. And uh, my last comment here actually would be that uh, I'm not going to uh, preach about the climate change or biodiversity loss or any of these exponentially growing threats. But the point is that now we are on the speeding curve of it and the longer we wait, the more difficult, more costly it will come. And so we really have very narrow uh, window of time to start doing, acting uh, totally more and, and tenfold more ambitious uh, level. Uh, uh, it's about window of 10 to 15 years. And mm -hmm. I, I, I guess that we do not all uh, be it what part of the world political party or person or business some already get it but some don't and we who get it our responsibility is to uh, to convey the message to our partners in financial community in construction industries in politics in in civil society or be, be it what uh, whatever so raise the bar whatever is your dream level that is double it right the, our house is burning. Our house is burning. What are we going to do about it? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Any other final comments before we uh, wrap up this session? Uh, Uwe, do you have anything you want to add? Uh... No, not not really. I'm I'm really I'm really happy, more than happy to see what what's what's going on now in in politics. And this is, as I said earlier, this is what we were looking and waiting for for many many years. So definitely, as also as Sofa said, we need definitely to speed up and and uh, we, we shouldn't try to to find the, the universal solution. It must be on on the local limit. And and I'm very very sure also that the example Willem said about the, the Dutch cities. I think everybody now in politics and in environmental uh, politics uh, has understood it's time is running and so we, we are speeding up and I'm really happy to see that and that's great. So looking into a more or less bright future and I think it's still ti enough time to, to stop this uh, development uh, which, which we currently have. Yes, we can get that fire under control. Thank you. I for hope so. 
Yeah. Thank you for your support of me, but we don't have very much time. Anybody else uh, want to comment? Uh, Super quick thoughts? remark, uh, fully abide to all the comments which have been made. Uh, the commission is also a guardian of the treaty, NESPA, so a lot of a key to manage. How beautiful also to join more the forces with European Parliament, and not to mention, of course, our member states to secure that the things get implemented nationally. Huh? Because we get bombarded those days with questions about you know, problems that are happening at an extremely local level without any lack of capacity ourselves to carry out, you know, we couldn't, even if we, would, we, we are not able to carry out inspections, to check ourselves, remedy ourselves problems at local level. So also about building better the capacity of our member states to implement is really important. That's an agenda for implementation where I think industry, parliament, everyone in our capacity should be, you know, assisting to our, for this practical transformation. So we try our best. We did every all hands on deck, as we say all the time. Thanks again. Thank you. Wilhelm, last word. No, I totally agree with, uh, with Veronica. Um, there is, there's much to do, but we have very good uh, developments and working together is really key. Yes, thank you. Well, if anybody can solve uh, the problem of the world being on fire, it's the Europe, our Europeans who have been leaders in many, many policy fronts. I wanna thank you all for joining us. The world is watching. We want to see some great things come out of uh, the European Union in terms of greening our cities. And thank you all again for, for joining us today. Um, it's been a really interesting session. And let's continue to work wherever we are around the world for a better future for our, ourselves and our children and our children's children. It's uh, tremendously important. It's a legacy that we as a generation leave that will hopefully uh, carry on for centuries afterwards. Thank you very much, everyone. I think that's a wrap. Um, Milena, I'm turning it over back over to you and have a great afternoon, everyone.